Hangers, welcome to Teaching Fishing Coffee Hour Plus. Captain Lance Valentine here with you tonight. Good to see everybody. Hope you are doing well. Hope your week is off to a good start. We are uh, excited to be back here. Um, had a nice weekend over at the Grand Rapids Sports Show. That was nice to be over to Grand Rapids and see some people we hadn't seen in a while. Always enjoy getting a chance to get out and see people. Oh, whew. <laughs> good to see everybody. See, so we've got some uh, new people on tonight. Uh, always good to see some new people. Kurt, uh, Kurt is a new person with us here. We've got a lot of the old faces here. Larry, Kurt, Mike, Paul's with us. Gary, Ray, Chris, 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 couple of Chris's. James, Corey, Bob, Phil, everybody's with us. Good to see the whole whole gang with us tonight. So, Ken is with us for the first time. Been studying the fun foundational series all winter. Is excited to get going soon. All right, it is uh, is that time of year. It is definitely the time of year that we need to start thinking about uh, <laughs> walleye fishing. So, all right, let's. Uh... Yeah, it's definitely time. So, let's take just a few extra seconds here. Let me. I'm going to get this settled in here. Do this. Let me get everything dialed in. Let me get everything dialed in. All right. And we can actually get close. <laughs> Jason says, walleye, it's coho time. And it is. Hi, Ryan. Uh, good to see everybody. Corey says, it's always good to get back and see your teaching fishing friends. He says, good evening. Is it just me or do others instantly feel better when they come on and see all their teaching fishing buddies? That's good to appreciate that, guys. I really do. Really, really, really do. Okay. All right. Again, I hope everybody is doing well. Uh, welcome again to Teach and Fish and Coffee Hour Plus presented by Procure. We are excited. This is our second week of doing the new uh, format of Coffee Hour. So we always uh, starting with uh, a little bit of educational stuff. Uh, I, I don't want to say a formal seminar because it's really not that. But uh, focusing on some education, then we'll kind of go into some fun stuff. Uh, as we get going uh, through the night, I'm going to wait here just one more minute as we pop in and we hit 835. We're going to start tonight um, and we are talking tonight. Tonight's kind of cool. We're talking about water coloring, water clarity. So if you notice last week, we talked about the in fisherman calendar periods and what we are working on is the, the next couple of weeks kind of working through some foundational things that number one, you need to know. Number two, are gonna help you catch more fish. Number three, are very important foundational things to understand what we are going to teach as we go through the year here at Teach and Fish and both here on the Teach and Fish and Educational Forum uh, with some other, other uh, uh, products we're gonna give you with Coffee Hour Plus every week. And then obviously the things that we're teaching over at the Teach and Fish, Teach and, fish and Anglers Club uh, these foundational things the next couple of weeks are really important to understand kind of what we teach and how we teach. So uh, if everybody's ready, let's uh, get going here. We're going to talk tonight about water color and water clarity. And these are two things that are extremely important uh, in your trip planning. Number one, when you're uh, getting ready, you're planning your trip before you head out. And number two, they're a very important part of the process of going through putting together a pattern as you're fishing uh, when you're on the water, right? So um, water color and water clarity, two things that we talk about kind of together. Uh, they're two different things, but they kind of come together to kind of uh, help us make a decision on where we should fish. Now, water color and water clarity are gonna determine where we should fish. They're gonna determine what types of lures we should use, how close to the fish we need to be. Uh, when we're running our lures, colors are gonna be a big deal. Uh, all of that's going to be a big deal when we talk about water color and water clarity. So let's kind of get moving on here so we can get this. We can get to some questions. All right. Let's talk about some options for water color. 
They're very simple, right? Don't make this too hard. Don't make this any harder than it really is. Uh, we just break down watercolor into three colors. They're very simple. Blue uh, is usually too clear to support life, especially plankton, insects. Blue water can, can actually be too blue and not support any life. I try to not really fish a lot of blue water. Brown water is usually too dirty for good fish. We're going to come back and talk about brown water in just a second. Uh, Matt made a good point, a one word point I want to talk about a little bit later. Brown is usually too dirty for good fishing, uh, hard for fish to find your lures. Remember, walleyes have a, a lot of great senses that they use, but we know for a fact that walleyes need to physically see their bait or their prey before they attack it. So sometimes brown water can be too dirty to actually have walleyes feed effectively. And then green water, that is my favorite uh, every day. I love to find green water. It has that right mix of a little bit of color. So you're kind of hiding your tracks and it's not crystal clear. So it's supporting life, but it's also not so brown that fish can't see your lures. It's kind of that perfect thing. So you can see my pro point there, number four, find the green, stay out of the blue, stay out of the brown. And that's very, very important. There was a tournament not too long ago, um, a PWT tournament, one of the last years the PWT fished down in Lake Erie and they were fishing off of the islands they're out of Catawba, um, uh, Port Clinton area there. And there was about 60 guys in one little stretch of green water that ran about three quarters of a mile and was probably 300 yards wide. They were all in line working through that green water. That's the only place they could really, really catch fish. So um, green water is extremely important. Uh, again, I have fished lots of places <laughs> around the walleye world. Uh, I've bass fished, um, you know, salmon fished. Green water, no matter what you're fishing for, no matter what type of body water you're fishing, the greenest water you can find is always going to be good and give you a chance to catch some fish. So find the green, stay out of the blue, stay out of the brown, All right? Let's talk about water clarity now. So again, uh, you don't, you know, when we first started doing this, the thing was to put a, a white lure in, in the water and see how, how deep you can see the white lure, uh, that's a lot of stuff to kind of do, right? Um, we just break down here at Teach and Fishing, we break water clarity down in basically, again, three parts. Uh, clear, where you're able to see your prop. You can actually look down behind the boat and see your prop very clearly. Stained, you can see your cavitation plate, but not see the prop. And then dirty, you can't see the cavitation plate even, it's that dirty of water. Um, so uh, Jason, hang on, That that's, 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 uh, um, that's a good question, and I'm going to answer that because um, that is a really, really good question. And I see some guys talk about that. We're going to get that in just a second, guys. So sit tight. Let me get through this, and we'll get to the questions. Uh, stained water is my favorite, uh, no matter where I'm fishing. So I like green stained, sometimes even green clear, right? To me, to me, the color is more important than the clarity. I, I'll take green water, even if it looks a little, I'm gonna call it thick, uh, got a little bit of stuff in it. I'm okay with that, uh, as long as it's green. If it gets too brown, uh, I try to stay out of it. Now, uh, my favorite, without question, my favorite is stained green. Can see my cavitation plate, not my prop, and it's got green color to it. That is absolutely my favorite. I call that eerie perfect, okay? All right, so how are we gonna find this? If you go to teachandfishing.com uh, backslash trips.html, you have access to a couple tools that are gonna let you look at the water color, both as you're playing a trip and actually as you're on the water. Uh, the satellite overview being the one that I use the most, looking at it today. Still a lot of ice on Saginaw Bay. If you guys think about going to Saginaw Bay, there's a, still a ton of ice, obviously not fishable ice, but still a lot of ton of ice on Saginaw Bay. So I use this overview. You can get to it through teachandfishing.com uh, through our resource center. I use that satellite overview a lot to determine where the green water is. I use it a lot on Detroit River. Uh, more or less on Detroit River, I use it to kind of see what's happening on Lake St. Clair and where that dirty water is being pushed on St. Clair, because that's going to determine where it goes uh, on the Detroit River. So remember, blue, green, brown, stay out of the blue, stay out of the brown, find the green, and then clear, you can see your prop, stay and see your cavitation plate, dirty, you can't see your cavitation plate, aim for stained green if you can find it again. I call that eerie perfect, and it has been 
the best water every place that I have ever fished for just about any species. Okay. All right. So let's kind of go into this. I see some good questions and good comments. Because this is a great topic that I think too many people kind of ignore. Jason Kelly says, does this even hold true for the spring uh, Lake Erie fishing? He says, I have found sometimes mud is your friend. Uh, I would say that mud is never your friend. Uh, I would say that dirtier water can be your friend. So Matt uh, made a great point. He said turbidity. And there's a big difference between brown water because it's brown, colored brown, or brown water because it's got stuff in it, if that makes sense, right? So there's two types of brown. There's brown water. Now, brown water can be, especially brown water that stains. So you can see your cavitation plate, but the water's got a brown tint to it. That can be good in spring and fall because that browner, the browner the water is, the more heat it's going to hold. But once you start getting particles in the water, once you start getting turbidity, once you start getting, um, uh, I'm gonna call it thick water, we've actually got particles in it, um, it gets tough to fish. Fish don't like it, especially in the springtime and fall time. It'll actually clog up their gills if you get enough dirt or mud in it. So we've got to clarify between brown colored water and water with stuff in it that's making it brown, if that makes sense, right? Um, Holly Reservoir here is a great example. The water is brown most of the time. Every once in a while, you'll find some green, but it's kind of got a brown stain to it. But if you scoop it up in a jar and hold it up to the sun, you can see right through it. So it's just brown colored. Um, it's not dirty brown. So sometimes in spring and fall, finding a little bit of brown water can get the water a little bit warmer but make sure it's not mud creating it. Make sure it's just surface color, if that makes sense to you. Um, someone said, uh, Jason says, pea soup is my favorite. You know, we used to call it Mountain Dew color on Saginaw Bay. We look for, you know, look for the Mountain Dew water. If it looks like Mountain Dew, fish it. Um, that was kind of kind of what we always looked for. Uh, Jim Mix says, have seen several reports praising the mud line. So remember where you get two different water colors together. I don't care if it's blue to brown or blue to green, green to brown. If you get that line where you've got two different types of color coming together, it's the same as a weed edge. It's the same as two types of weeds. It's the same as a thermocline. It is an edge and fish will absolutely love it. The only time I've had really good luck fishing in not just brown water, but brown water with a little bit of stuff in it uh, is out west uh, in Missouri River reservoirs mostly. Um, because some of those those walls are just they're, they're just like chalk, right? They're they're uh, they're more clay than anything else. And you'll get a wind up there, and then you'll get a mud line, and you can cast a jig right up into that mud line a little bit. And when it gets to the edge, you catch a lot of fish. That really has a tendency sometimes to turn on the shallow water bite out there, uh, out in those western reservoirs. But uh, I try to avoid again brown water. But if you get brown water, again, if you get brown water, you can see your cavitation plate. It's not that bad. Brown water that actually is chunky <laughs> is very bad. Uh, Matt makes a great point. Green water near the brown is good. The brown water warms in the sun faster, but you're gonna catch more fish in the green or right on the edge more times than not. The problem with brown water, especially dirty brown water where there is stuff in it, is there's a ton of fish on your sonar because it does, especially this time of year, it does warm faster. So there's a lot of fish in there, but they're really, really hard to get to bite because they have a hard time seeing your lures. So if you can find that where that brown water kind of thins into green, that is a great spot uh, to be in, okay? Uh, Charlie says, can clarity and color change with depth? Is what we see at the prop, what is actually what is below? Absolutely not, Charlie. Uh, Absolutely, let me back up. The answer to the first part of your question, can clarity and color change with depth is absolutely yes. Uh, I'll guarantee you there are times that we're looking at one color and or clarity at the surface and where our lures are, it's different. Usually there are times, and this is, <laughs> Charlie, that's a great question. This, this is a Detroit, really a Detroit River thing that I deal with every day. I may see even dirty water. I mean, brown water that's got stuff in it. So, I, you know, Let's bet, let me let me clarify. Brown water, just the color brown, is okay. Dirty water is brown water that has I'm going to call it stuff, for lack of a better word. Um, it's 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 got dirt in it. It's got mud. It's created by mud. All right. Sometimes we will get 
dirty water actually rolling down the river. You can actually see the mud kind of rolling on the surface, but sometimes it's only the top three or four feet and below it, the fish don't care. Um, it does cut down sunlight penetration a little bit. Sometimes in shallow water, it actually get the fish to feed. It is sometimes you do need to change your uh, lure colors because you know you get a little different sunlight, but there are times that having dirty water on the surface, especially when it first starts, can actually create good fishing because the water down below is still clear. So we have to determine what's creating the brown and or the dirty water. Is it runoff? Is it stuff coming in from streams that's kind of carrying gunk and dirt and crud with it? Or is it just a matter that maybe the waves are slapping up against an unimproved shoreline and bringing in a little bit of dirt at the surface and it's washing down? So there, brown water is kind of a, 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 a guess. You will learn over the years, especially if you keep good records, you will learn to look at the water and go, Bleh, can't fish here. Um, there's definitely a, a site, a very, uh, how do I say it? A visual texture to, wa to water that is too brown, too brown to fish. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Jason says, what about algae blooms? Are those fishable? Good algae blooms, green algae are fishable. Uh, and they're, they're great because they draw algae eating bait fish, shiners and shad specifically up to the surface. They bring walleyes and game fish to the surface. Um, a good bite because these fish are at the bottom. The bad algae, the blue green algae we have, you really don't want to fish that. It's, it's taking up oxygen. Uh, it doesn't attract any bugs to eat it or any, uh, um, any insects or any bait fish to eat it. So there's two different types of algae. There's good algae. Uh, there's the green algae, there's the blue green, that's the toxic stuff you don't want to fish. You can absolutely fish an algae bloom without question. Corey says, something interesting for guys that travel darker water that may turn walleyes off can bring sauger shallower and more active. They do better even in low light and faster current. Saugers have a little different um, eye structure than walleyes do. They do better in more turbid water. So if you have though, Jim Bishop makes a great point. If you have those two species in your uh, water, as you go further south, you'll have walleyes and saugers. Water that is too turbid to turn, that turns off walleye may actually be okay for sauger. Corey makes a great point. And Jim Bishop says, right, yeah, tannic stained or tannic colored water, um, you know, usually it's from uh, water that runs through swamps or rotten wood will create a tannic color that kind of that brownish color, um, that's different than turbid water. So there is a difference between brown color and turbidity. There are different, those are two different things. Um, Chris says, turbidity can make or break a water color and can change with depth. You can absolutely get mud at a depth that you, maybe you're fishing when it's nice on top. So there's a lot of this stuff, you know, that's why we, you know, we use the fish hawk, right, to kind of watch. Excuse me, I'm drying up here quick. That's why the fish hawk is so important to kind of watch currents, not just to watch. Um, so uh, put that whole puzzle together, right? So so that overhead satellite view where we can kind of see where we, where we want to fish and where the dirty water is in relationship to where we are. Then you kind of look at the fish hawk and see which way the currents are actually moving. And now you've got to kind of make a, you got to get in your head and kind of make a, a three-dimensional view of what is that current, that subsurface current and or surface current, what is that doing with that dirty water that's over here? Is it bringing it to me or is the current pushing the, the water away? Could that current actually bring uh, turbid water to where I'm fishing and actually turn my bite off? So there's lots of pieces to this water color, water clarity puzzle that go on every day, right? And, you, and you've got to be thinking in three dimensions, you got to be thinking about all this stuff as you're fishing, especially as you're open water trolling or you're fishing places like, um, uh, you know, like the Detroit River. Uh, Jason says the algae bloom can be dicey at times. I've seen it on downscan where the algae is from the top to 15 feet down. Uh, all the marked fish were 17 to 20 down, but active. Again, that's good green algae and that attracts, definitely attracts uh, algae eating bait fish, which obviously there's a bunch of bait fish, there's gonna be a bunch of game fish. So it can be good. Uh, Jim says, is this the same as a scum line? Um, not really. A scum line is usually created by two different surface temperatures hitting together. So that's more, a uh, scum line is more of a thermal break um, where kind of stuff gathers because it's in 
uh, warmer water and it can't penetrate that colder water or the stuff comes in colder water and can't penetrate into the warmer water. So a scum line, Jimmy, is more created by a thermal break than it is a color break. Sometimes there will be a color break associated with the scum line, but not always. Um, great question. I like that. Uh, Mitch says on the Western basin, less than 25 feet is the water clarity and color generally the same throughout the water column. Generally, I would say yes. I would definitely not say always. So it's something you need to be aware of. Again, as you're fishing green water, you may start to see it get a little bit browner. But if that brown, if the clarity of that brown stays good, you can see your cavitation play. It's probably not going to turn your fishing off. It may some days actually turn it on because it cuts light penetration. But if you see that brown come and there is turbidity in it, it's definitely going to start to shut down the bite. So it depends on what's coming out. Yeah, it, it's definitely not the same from top, to, definitely not the same from top to bottom. Um, Joe says he's caught plenty of fish in the algae bloom. Absolutely, the green algae bloom is great. We love them on Saginaw Bay. Um, it's just, you wanna stay away from that toxic blue green algae that destroys oxygen and it has no value as far as food goes to bait fish. Uh, Corey says the blue water is bad if there's large diversity of deep water bait fish like Cisco and Smelt. Um, not as bad, but again, you know, places like Houghton or Higgins Lake, uh, salmon fishing even in Lake Michigan, Lake Ontario, some of the salmon fishing I've done in Lake Ontario, uh, deep water walleye fishing in Dunkirk, New York, where you're fishing walleyes in 80, 90, 100, 120 feet of water. And the, and the fish are down 50, 60, 70 feet. Salmon are down 80, 90, 100 feet. Green surface water is always the best. It's very rare that you catch fish in the blue water where you can see you know, your downrigger cable down 20 feet. There's something about green water that is just better than blue and better than brown. Ken says, will the bait fish travel long distances to get out of the brown water or do they stay in it? Uh, depends on the situation, Ken. That's, 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 that's a great question. Um, number one, they won't swim long distances. If the water gets too dirty, they're going to start moving out of it and stay ahead of it, right? They're not going to go, oh, all of a sudden it's brown and they're going to swim 20 miles to get away with it. They will start to move away from it. But again, they're not going to move out of the brown if the brown stays clear or stained. They're going to start moving out of the brown if it starts to get turbid. So understand there's a difference between the color brown and actually having stuff in the water turning the water brown, if that makes sense. I don't know how else to explain that, right? I just, I don't know how to, um, you know, sometimes water is turned brown because of the bottom or the uh, water or the, um, uh, the environment flows through. It, it has a brown color to it. Sometimes water that's green turns brown because there's mud. Those are two completely different things. Um, so there you go. Jason says brown water can be very productive. Gold, rust color lures. I like coppers uh, and, you know, again, stained brown water if I have to fish it or I'm fishing that edge. Um, I like coppers. Uh, he likes gold, rust. Those type of colors absolutely work well. Um, one thing about brown water, I'll tell you this. You definitely want to stay away from silvers in brown water. It's, it's funny how... Um, I've seen underwater pictures. You get in, in, in clear or stained brown water and silvers and sometimes even golds, they just blow up. They got this big aura around them. So you want a little more subdued colors, coppers. Uh, I do really well with, you know, with blacks, um, uh, dark blues, dark purples, uh, you know, purple demon being one of my favorite in brown water. I, it's, it's funny that that brown water sometimes actually magnifies the light and makes bright stuff too bright and makes it have like a big giant glow. Um, Emmett says black and blue uh, in the brown in the in the brown water. I, I like a little bit subdued colors. Copper's great, rust, black, purple. I like those colors um, in that browner water. Um, Jason says from his experience, rain runoff will dirty just the surface with cleaner water below it. That happens a lot in Detroit. You'll get a little bit of runoff and the surface will get a little bit of color. And because the current is so fast, um, it doesn't start to get, so it may come in at one point and be you know, brown on the top, clear on the bottom. But remember at some point that sediment's gonna start to settle. So further downstream, it may actually be dirty, right? It may actually have turbidity in it as that 
those sediments start to settle as you get further away from where it comes in. So it's 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 definitely a game of, you know, what is happening. Now, there's times in the Detroit River, and you can actually see the mud. That's why my, my Detroit River, most of my decisions about water, color and water clarity happen with what's happening on Lake St. Clair, because that's where Detroit River gets its color. Um, uh, the Detroit River color and clarity is affected by what happens on the east and south shore of Lake St. Clair. Traditionally, that water comes down and stays on the east side, on the Canadian side, but every once in a while, we'll get a north, northeast, or an east wind. It'll blow that dirt over to the American side, and it comes down the river. There's been days on the Detroit River we've actually chased the fish and stayed ahead of that dirty water. So you go up and make a pass, and you fish it, and as you get done with your pass, you go up, and all of a sudden, it's dirty, so you start your pass you know, quarter mile further down, and it's, the water's staying clear. You're staying ahead of the of the brown water, and then all of a sudden the dirt comes, and you know you, the bite shuts off for a day or two until the dirt cleans out. So, um, if you're if you're a Detroit River guy, you need to pay attention to the South Shore of St. Clair and how wind is moving that dirt uh, to the Detroit River. Uh, Corey says, "Bass guys in the South swear by black and blue in the mud holes." I do too. Um, <laughs> Matt says he's trolled brown water and his lines had goo on it. That can happen. Um, you know, brown water has a lot of, usually traditionally has a lot of particles in it, especially if the water is traditionally clear or green. Uh, when it gets brown, sometimes you, it, it is created by a bunch of stuff in the water. Uh, Dave says, not a color question. Do you put Procure on crankbaits when trolling? Uh, I do. Um, I absolutely use Procure on my crankbaits and spoons when I'm trolling. If I'm trolling middle of the water column, which I almost always am with crankbaits and spoons, uh, I like anything that smells like a minnow. Gizzard Shad, Shiner, Elwife. Uh, I'll try to match the scent to what the fish are feeding on. But every once in a while, I may just try a different minnow scent. Um, but I use, if I'm up in the middle of the water column and the fish are biting on, you know, feeding on bait fish, I will use definitely a scent that is a bait fish scent. Um, Brian says the good algae bloom at a certain time of year. Uh, traditionally, J Jim makes a great point here. Traditionally, yes. And, and the warmer the water gets, the flatter, hotter, and calmer it stays. The longer we get hot, flat, calm water, the more the algae bloom is, right? Because remember, we've talked about this forever. If you're in a body of water that has shiners and shad that are algae feeders, right? The hotter, flatter, calmer it stays, you get three, four days of hot, flat, calm water. All the algae comes and gets in these big mats. All the bait fish come there. The fish are on the surface. They're not on the bottom. It's 80 degrees outside. Excuse me, 74 degrees, 75 degrees surface temperature, 85 degrees outside. Sun's beating down at 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. The walleyes are six feet, four, five, six feet deep feeding on those bait fish that are feeding on the plankton. So Absolutely. Brian, the, 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 the warmer it gets, the more plankton and more algae blooms we see. Jim Bishop, uh, great point. Is anyone using the plankton mapping on your electronics? Sirius has plankton mapping for saltwater. I don't know if they have it on the freshwater version or not. But I know they do have it for the saltwater. Mike says, Huron uh, has been very blue the last couple of years. Um, are you talking about Huron, Ohio or Lake Huron. Two different things there. So, um, but again, you know, last fall, or two falls ago specifically, um, uh, in our fishing education week in October, we had to get out into 50, 51, 52 feet of water to find the right green water. It was too blue close in, and then it kind of got clear green. And then once we got that little bit of stained green out in that 50, 51, 52 feet of water, the fishing was a whole lot better. Matt says he loves bright greens and purples. And dirty water, as do I. I love purples. Uh, Joe says, I do good until the algae bloom gets really green or really thick. Then I stop fishing until the fall and the algae is gone and temps start dropping. Uh, so my question, Joe, would be this. Um, are you adjusting how you fish when the algae bloom is out? So, Because remember, most walleye guys, for whatever reason, are taught when the sun comes up, the water's clear, it's bright, it's hot, you need to go to the bottom and go slow. And that is completely wrong. Um, you get a really good algae bloom and the thicker it gets, the higher the bait fish come, um, the higher the walleyes come. You know, there are days, like I said, it's 80, 85, 90 degrees surface temperature. It's, uh, or 80, 85, 90 degrees 
uh, air temperature. It's 75, 76, 78 surface temperature. It's been that way for four days. I catch more fish from nine o'clock to noon than I ever do from seven to nine. Uh, and I'm running crankbaits two, two and a half, three, three and a half miles an hour, 10 feet behind the board. You know, they're running three, four feet deep and I'm running all around the edges of those algae blooms and we're cleaning up on the walleye. So are you fishing where the fish are when the algae really starts to go? You need to be up where the bait fish are. Uh, Jarek says, if it's been cloudy for a few days where there are no useful cell images, how to predict and find the right color water. So Jarek, great question. And here's what I'm going to tell you. We've been preaching this forever here. Trip planning for fishing is an everyday process. If you are serious about fishing, you are looking at surface currents, subsurface currents, water temperatures, water clarity, your wave, wind direction, wave direction. You're looking at that every single day, even if you're not going fishing till Saturday. Because what will happen is if you start looking at Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or what Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you get good satellites, you start to see a pattern happening. All of a sudden you can't get a satellite on Thursday and Friday. If all those other conditions stay the same, and that, let's say the brown water is moving a half a mile east each day, you can assume that by Saturday, it's gonna move another two days, so another mile east. So if you're looking at it every single day, you start to see patterns emerge. You start to see when the changes happen. So if you can't get the information a day or two before you fish or the day of fishing, you still have a pretty good idea. That's why we preach here. Look, at, I know everybody's busy. I, I get that. But just just get, get those sites dialed in, get them bookmarked. You know, uh, the Great Lakes Coastal Forecasting, the satellite. Make a point to check those every single day, guys. Spend 10 or 15 minutes. Start keeping a logbook of where the, the information is on the body of water you're fishing. You'll be surprised, even if you're not fishing for a couple of days, just keeping track of all of that, all the weather, all the wind, maybe grab the barometric pressure, right? All of that, keeping track of it is gonna be huge. So if you do get a day, you can't get the information. You've got an idea of what's happening. You're not going blind from information 10 days ago. So there you go, Jarek. Um, Jason says, jigging for musky muddy water. I always pull out the black bondy bait. I do like black. Uh, <laughs> Matt's funny. Chasing the right water is key to stay on a good bite, but it can be challenging. Absolutely can be challenging, especially the days that the mud is coming. Um, uh, the mud is coming to where you are. You're like, no, stay away. Um, and sometimes the fish will actually stay in the mud and they just shut off. Uh, sometimes they'll stay ahead of it too. So it depends. Mitch says, so the amount of particles in the water determine the clarity. Yes. So water color is a function of just water color where the environment it runs through. The clarity is going to be determined by, or the turbidity by the stuff that's actually in it, particles that are actually in it. Great point, Mitch. That's probably the easiest way to look at it. Uh, Joe says, usually end of July, mid-August, fishing slows down. Uh, and it does. If you uh, if you went and did any studying on the in-fisherman calendar periods we talked about last week, you'll see that that is kind of that end of the summer period and the summer transition as we start to kind of transition into post-summer. Um, and the reason that fishing gets really tough that time of year mostly is there's so much bait in the water. Everything, all the bait fish have hatched. Everything is maxed out. Um, there's a ton of bait in the water. Fish don't need to eat a lure because they have all the live bait in the world they want. It's hard to compete against real food, right? Um, so that's why fishing kind of shuts down the end of the summer period into post-summer. That's why that little fishing is tough. And then we sit and we wait until uh, the water starts to cool down again. And there we go. Uh, Jason says, quick question on Procure. How do you clean it off when you're done? Uh, I carry a little bucket in the boat with uh, just white ivory soap and a little toothbrush. And I just put a little bit of water in there, just a little tinge of ivory soap. And I just brush the lures off, hang them up, let them dry, and then put them away. Um, but you definitely want to take it off every day because it can get sticky. Uh, Mike says Lake here on Outer Bay. Yeah, usually the further you get away from shore, and Mike makes a great point, right? Lake Huron has stayed fairly blue. That's why we don't see the charity bite like we used to. One of the things that used to create the bite out on the steeples by the charity islands was we'd get the right wind and the right weather 
would blow the right water in, it'd blow in green water, a little bit warmer water, and here would come some bait, and all of a sudden these fish would come out to these steeples. Uh, they followed the bait there, and they'd go. We haven't had a good steeples bite for the last, I don't know, four, five, six, seven years because we haven't had the right water clarity out there. It's been too clear. So there's a great point of stay out of the blue. Uh, Kim says use a bleachless disc detergent, a scrub brush, and a bucket. Yep, I just carry a little Tupperware container, put a little bit of water, just a little squirt of white ivory soap with a toothbrush, and then I empty it all out, put the top on the, the lid on it, and put it away in, in a storage compartment. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Scott says get in Bryce's boat for a few hours. I'm assuming, Scott, that Bryce likes to run around. I bet you Bryce isn't running around all day today, all day this year. <laughs> <laughs> Jason said a great book on currents called Lake Michigan in Motion. I don't know about that. There you go. Uh, Matt, our good buddy over at uh, Slow Trolling uh, LLC, slowtrolling.com, he says he's added all the sites he uses on his website. Uh, we have them all on teachingfishing.com. Go to the resource page. Um, we've, got, we've got all of them, uh, as does Matt on his website. Joe says, do you run harnesses or plastic? I, I don't run crawlers at all, Joe. I haven't had a crawler in my boat in a dozen years. Um, so usually if the bite is is high like that and I'm going fast, it's always crankbaits. Um, and it's usually a little bit smaller crankbaits, right? It's usually, you know, flicker sheds. Um, uh, I saw some really great new baits from Walleye Nation's Creations this week that I can't wait to get my hands on little bogey shads or little shaky shad. Those are going to be awesome because usually when you get that big algae bloom, it's kind of right after all the baits. So there's a lot of little one and a half, two inch you know, bait in the water column. So sometimes downsizing your lure because that's what the fish are feeding on and getting high in the water column and moving fast. And I mean fast, three, three and a half miles an hour with plastics is huge. Um, Dan says fishing really heats up late summer, favorite time of the year. It should, you know, it's, it's one of those things, late summer is one of those uh, give and take things, right? Fish are eating more often because their metabolism is higher. They're burning through the food um, faster. So they are eating more often. The negative to that is there's a lot of bait in the system. So um, it's harder for them to find or be attracted to your uh, artificial lure. Um, but it can be great fish. If you can find the right pot of fish just as they're getting ready to feed, it can be lights out fishing. Uh, usually summer though, late summer fishing, if you're going to have a good day, it's a lot of moving. It's a couple of fish from this pod, a couple of fish from that pod, a couple of fish from this piece of structure, a couple of fish over here. It's not usually a stay in one spot and catch a bunch like it is in early summer. You have to have a tendency to be on the right spot on a hungry pot of fish when they bite, and it can be great fishing. Uh, Jim says you can see the sediment plumes out of any major river into Erie. Yeah, watch the overhead the next, you know, next couple of weeks. You'll see big, giant brown water plumes, dirt, and you can actually tell it's dirty water coming from St. Clair down the Detroit River, coming from Lake Huron into St. Clair, um, coming from Detroit into Lake Erie, coming from the Maumee into Lake Erie. Uh, you can really start to see these big plumes of brown. So it, it'll be, the next couple of days will be a fun time to watch. Uh, John says, when rivers get dirty and it's tough to get bites, even though you're marking fish, in my experience, uh, it's best to move upstream. That's where the cleanest water will show first. Uh, John's going to bring back a good memory here. In 1999, John Campbell, two days, was leading the PWT on Detroit below the Ambassador Bridge. And on the final day, had to move upriver to the mouth to catch enough to win. It wasn't that all the fish moved to the mouth, rather they became catchable because the improved clarity. Great point. So if you're looking at the Detroit River, and it was funny because my buddy Billy St. Peter finished second in that tournament, just, I mean, literally a quarter of a pound or so behind John. And he was doing just the opposite. He kept moving downstream, staying ahead of the dirt. John went upstream because in the Detroit River, the first place to clear is upstream, right? So my buddy Billy was working his way downstream every pass and staying ahead of the dirt. And John went upstream and got the new clean water coming in. Um, and I think John won by, I don't know, four or five tenths of a pound, right? So two ways of handling it. But the, 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 the lesson there is they both stay out of the dirty water. John went up to get the new clean water. Billy kept working his way downriver to stay ahead of the dirt. So two ways to do it. Um, so there you go. Matt says post-spawn bite is best. I like fishing post-spawn. Uh, 
Absolutely. Okay, let's wrap that up. Um, good conversation. I hope you guys learned a little bit there. We've got uh, about 10 more minutes. Um, so let's just kind of open it up to uh, whatever you guys uh, want to talk about. Great conversation tonight. I hope you guys got the uh, materials, the study materials. Uh, you can go to teachingfishing.com and uh, on our four little pictures in the middle of the page there, there's one that says Coffee R Plus. We've got some great materials. We did a article for this, a short little video, and you guys can download the slides that we showed you today to have, uh, make notes. And again, remember I showed you last week uh, my old little notebook um, that I had. Um, so, you know, it's nice to keep notes. John says, John one by three. Are you sure about that, Bala? Check that out. I don't think that was right. I thought I thought Billy was really, really, really close. Um, so anyway, all right, what do you guys want to chat about? I've gotten a lot of questions about Canada. Um, here's what I'm going to tell you. I am not going to make a statement about going in and out of Canada uh, until I know for sure. Right now, the law says that you can, they call it loop boating. Um, you know, you can go in to Canada and then come back as long as you don't touch land, don't touch another boat. Uh, you can do that. But as of right now, you have to be vaccinated to do that. So um, that's what the law says. Um, I'm not going to tell you anything other than what the law says. So if you're looking at me to give you a new answer and say, yeah, sure, yeah, that's not going to happen. So um, I would tell you to check the laws and there are, they are available. Go look at them. Uh, Joe says, thank you. You're welcome, buddy. Appreciate it. Uh, Al, we'll talk about jigs a little bit later. I'll send you an email about jigs. Craig Nagy says, smooth moves or wave pro. Um, out of those two, wave pro, if you're asking me my opinion, I'd spend the extra money and get the air waves. Um, I've ridden in all of those. Uh, the air wave is exactly, uh, in my opinion, without question, the air wave pedestal is the best. Most expensive. Um, but it is the best because you can control, uh, by adding air, um, uh, a pump, you can control how much pressure it takes to move down and you can blow it up or let it put air in or take air out to adjust the, how fast it comes back up. So you have control of both the down and the up. You have complete control over that with the airway pedestal. Um, so, uh, out of the two, you, you, uh, two you're asking about wave pro for sure. But if you're asking me my opinion, uh, my favorite is the Airwave. Uh, Jeff says, what's the most impressive new thing from show season this year? Uh, you mentioned Walleye Nation Creations uh, Bay. Anything else we should check out? I didn't really see anything. I think a lot of that is the, the, there weren't a lot of, honestly, a lot of vendors this year. Uh, a lot of vendors don't have product to show. Um, so there wasn't really a big push of new stuff this year. Um, so I, I would tell you, you know, the only thing, I shouldn't say the only thing, but the, the biggest thing I saw that I'm like, ooh, I got to have some of those uh, are the new Walleye Nations creations. Some of their new crankbaits are awesome. So there you go. Corey says there's too many options in braided line. Yeah, we're going to we're gonna talk about braided line uh, in a week or two. Uh, we're going to talk about fishing line um, uh, in, in detail there. Grand Rapids show, slow, very few vendors, hardly any customers. Um, so there you go. Uh, Eric says, check out Sniper Braid if you're using live scope or live target. I'm assuming it's easy. You can actually see it on the sonar is what I'm, uh, I'm assuming. Uh, Jason Kelly says, the Boogie Shad from uh, Walleye Nation's Creations looks like a fish killer. They make a, they make a little size four that I can't wait to get my hands on. Uh, get that behind a lead core in the summertime on Saginaw Bay. Um, so there you go. Um, well, he did. I didn't think he won by that much, Johnny. Well, I didn't know it was that much. Thank, and of course you would know. You are you you are the guru, man. You are the guru uh, on old records. I love John. You and I need to get together and talk because I'd love to kind of do something on some of that older stuff. I think there's some stories there to be told. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate. I didn't think it was that much. I thought Billy was really really close. Um. Uh, Is the Fishhawk 4XD worth the 200 compared to the 4X? I don't use, uh, I use the portable one. Um, can't remember the number on it right now. This one right here. This is this is the one that I use. Uh, I can't see, I can't see with my glasses. 
Um, the 4XD, I think, is a Bluetooth version. Um, this is the X2. This is the one I use. I use the X2. Uh, it's portable because I do have multiple boats. I can move it from boat to boat. Uh, I think the difference between the 4X and the 4XD, I think, is Bluetooth capability. Um, I don't know if I would pay 200 bucks for that. So um, that's up to you. Uh, Jeff says, Novi, and I'd have to look, Mitch, so send me an email on that because let me let me do a little bit of research and look. I don't know exactly right off the top of my head what the difference is. Shoot me an email, Mitchie, and I'll um, I'll look into it for you and we'll, we'll chat about it. Uh, Novi was thin. I uh, heard Grand Rapids better. It wasn't much better. Um, the Saturday crowd at Grand Rapids was about a normal Thursday. Um, so, you know, and it wasn't that good all day. So, you know, from from a, a vendor point, it it wasn't a good show. So, um, there you go. Uh, Mike uh, has had he's dealt with Way Pro. I know Mike got some Way Pros the other day or a couple of weeks ago. So they've been very helpful. Yeah, I think all of them are good. Uh, I've I've ridden on all of them. I, I've had every single one of them in my boat. Uh, actually, I've had smooth moves, the smooth moves with the pump. I've I've had smooth moves in my boat, airwave in my boat. I've ridden on the smooth move electric one that that you know adjust, and I've I've ridden in boats with the Wave Pro. By far, my favorite is the Airwave, without question. It's it's the softest; you can get it adjusted just perfect, um, and it, it, it's the one that protects your back, but gives you the least amount of movement up and down. So, there you go. Uh, all right, what else can we chat about here real quick? Um, picked up some Samuel Shallon and Rattling Hornets. Good lure. Mark Panazak loves those little hornets. Uh, Jeremy Marsh, you can put me on a spot. Prediction for NWT weights. I'm not going to make a prediction. I will make a prediction Monday night prior to the tournament. How's that? So a couple weeks. Um, we've still got two weeks of weather to come. That's going to change the temperature. It's going to change... Um, water color, water clarity, Jeremy. So put me on the spot the Monday night before they fish, and I will um, I will give you a prediction. I'm not against going uh, with a prediction, but it's still too early. A lot can happen in the next couple of days, uh, next couple of weeks. So there you go. <laughs> Good seeing you guys too, Roy. I appreciate that. Um, Brian says the 4D shows actual probe depth. Um, I again, I don't, I don't know what the difference is. The 4XD has an option to link it with the app to make a waypoint with depth, speed, and temp recorded at the ball. Uh, found that out at Dan Keating seminar this spring. I like that. Why? I wish we could get that to work at the Lawrence unit. Wouldn't that be nice, huh? Brian says heading to Drummond Island in June. I have fished Drummond Island. Without question, I have. Um, I have fished it in June, July, and late August. So I've fished it a lot. Um, can be really good, but again, up there at that part of the world, the Sioux, Drummond Island, I know a couple of guys here have fished up there. I know Johnny Bowles fished up there a couple of times. Um, the problem with that area is, is it's not Lake Erie or Saginaw Bay. Um, the fish are on very, very specific pieces of structure, and they have very, very short bite windows. So you may be on the best part the best piece of structure in the area you're fishing. And if you're not there the four times a day, the fish bite for 20 minutes, you'll swear there's nothing there. Uh, it's definitely sonar driven. Um, you need to use your sonar to find fish. You can't just randomly troll around or cast around because there's so much water and so much good water. Um, it's it, it, If you get on the right bite and you get it figured out, it can be uh, great fishing. If you don't, it can be four or five, six days of just you would think you'd never fish before in your life. So it is tough up there, very tough up there. I would tell you, uh, get a hold of somebody that that actually has um, Great Lakes paper charts because there is no map. Get the actual navigation charts. Um, uh, so you've got them because navigation, there's lots of spots that's really shallow. You're going to want those charts for showing you where to find some good structure to start looking. Uh, nothing really new coming from Lawrence right now uh, that I know of. Uh, as soon as something new comes out, we will um, let you know. Um, 
Mike says, do you teach at all on jigging in Lake Erie, specifically in Michigan waters versus Ohio? Uh, I don't teach a lot on uh, jigging. Uh, on the re I don't specifically teach about that. Um, but it's, it's, you know, it, it's basically the same thing. Find a piece of structure. We're drifting more than we are uh, vertical jigging. Uh, so your line's at a little bit of an angle, but the same type of stuff works. I think heavy jigs work well. You know, use different shaped bodies just like we do in the river. You know, maybe a really thin, one guy has a really thin worm on. Maybe one guy fishes a heavier plastic. Maybe one guy tips with a minnow. Uh, try multiple different things until you figure out jigging motions and how the fish want the, the jig to fall. Hair jigs are a great option when you're fishing down there. Um, try a bunch of different things and you'll find out uh, what's happening. So, okay. Forrest says, will the uh, shows ever come back? I don't know. <laughs> I hope so. All right, I'm getting a signal here that um, our internet is going in and out. We've had a uh, little bit of issues here the last couple of days. Yep. So I'm going to wrap it up. Um, thanks for joining me tonight, guys. I uh, appreciate it. Um, stay tuned to Teaching Fish and Educational Forum. We're going to have some follow-up stuff uh, this week. Appreciate your time. Next week, we're going to talk about uh, another really cool subject. Um, we'll let you know. So, again, we're having some issues here with the Internet. So I'm going to call it a night. Thank you for your time, guys. Appreciate you checking in Coffee Hour Plus. Please tell your friends about it. So if we can get more people here uh, every week, the funner it is, the more people we have, the, the, the better it is. All right. Check out the website, teachefishing.com. Lots of cool stuff on the public lounge. Check out our blogs. I think we got six pages uh, of articles now. So lots of cool stuff to read about. Um, just kind of dialing. It's getting close to fishing time. Can't wait. All right. We'll see you guys back here next week at Teaching Fishing Coffee Hour Plus next Monday night. Thanks for your time, right, guys. Uh, if you're going fishing, stay safe. We'll see you soon.